And getting to know Johnny means sooner than later, <laughs> celebrating. There's a man once who thought he'd preached too long, and he saw somebody in the congregation look at the watch, but he got really worried when we started to shake it. <laughs> wow, it's great to be here, and what a day. Yeah. Two scriptures. I have changed some of this, even walking down this morning, so not sure on some of it, but John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him, believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think the next one's pretty good as well. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to say that. And I think sometimes we forget that part. He don't come to condemn. So if we condemn, it's not doing what Jesus wants us to do. And the other verse I did have was, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, the founder, and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. That is absolutely amazing. Can I just say one thing? This is the most positive day we could ever be in. Today we celebrate Jesus defeating death. But he endured the cross for a reason, so that he might enter his joy. <coughs> you know, sometimes we have to live beyond the cross. The greatest accolade we could give to Jesus today is to thank him for what he's done, but now start living in it. Because if we don't live in it, it's as if it's never happened. And I think we've got to really begin to understand that. I've been challenged over the last few days. You know, Andrea mentioned it in a prayer about what we've been, I've been talking about the last few weeks has been be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. That inner being gets changed. Let's, what God's done in us come out. But the reason is so that we might hear God's voice and understand what he's saying to us. And this is a bit of a journey I've been on, so it might not to start with sound like a very Easter message, but it's all because of the cross. You know, some other things happen. The moment Jesus said it's finished, the curtain in the temple, a big thick curtain, massive, was torn from top to bottom. And we often say, oh, we now can go to God's throne. But somebody once said it was almost like God said, I'm out now, I'm free. I can come and live amongst you because of the death of Jesus. And that's why it says where two or three are gathered, I can be there in the midst now because of what Jesus has done. And that's the important things. And I think we have to live beyond just the physical death and say, this is now his joy. This is the joy he's entering into with us. So it's a great day. The day when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, defeated death, defeated sin, defeated every negative thing that was against us. And we're going to absolutely treat it's the greatest positive in history. Every negative was cancelled out by the cross. Sorry, I felt quite. Church of England, you yeah, sorry. <laughs> but I want to just share something that's been on my mind for the last few weeks. And I think sometimes it goes to challenge us some of our preconceived ideas and perceptions. I remember reading a modern translation of. Proverbs 3, you know it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make you pass straight. Or somebody, a, a, a new paraphrase, it was trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't rely on what you think you know. Don't rely on what you think you know. And I think that's a powerful thing, and it's actually begin to challenge me. You know, once you start preaching something about being renewed in your thinking, it's surprising if you're thinking and you're thinking lots about what you're going to share. Actually, it begins to affect you. And this is what's happened. And it's challenged my thinking, not relying on what I think I know. Because if I rely on what I think I know, that can be a hindrance to renew my mind. It's as if I know it now, God, I don't need to hear any more from you. But actually, there's so much more to hear. So I want to just go back to something I think I said two or three weeks ago about listening. Do you remember I said, you're not listening to what I'm saying? 
Do you remember we talked about that? Yeah. Or weren't you listening? <laughs> I can't hear what you're saying because you're not listening to me. It's not a simple thing, but we can hear without listening. And I just want to, I came across this the other day, Luke chapter 8, and it kind of took on a new significance for me because of what I'd said earlier about you not listening to me. And it's about the lamp, you know. No one has a lamp. And they put comes and puts a bucket over the top of it. No one has a lamp and hides it away because you want a lamp to give you light in the house. And it goes on, says there's nothing hidden that won't be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be made known and brought to the light. Even thinking about this, God's not concealing stuff from us. He wants us to know these things. It's not mystery. He wants to reveal mysteries to us, but are we listening? And it goes on, it says, and this really struck me, it said, pay attention, therefore, to how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken from him. Mm. Careful how you listen. And if you're listening right, you're going to have more added to you. Yeah. But if you're not even listening, there'll be a time when even what you think you have won't mean a thing, it'll be gone. Careful how you listen. And from our perspective, it's listening to God. This is what it's all about. Pay attention. I look to this word, to think. And actually, we get our word dogma from it. The Greek word there, our dogma. Well, you know, if you say somebody's dogmatic, you might not change what they're thinking. So if we're too dogmatic, we miss another person's point of view. And we can walk out and we never share anything because they're not listening anyway. And it can be me as well who's not listening. So I'm not pointing any fingers, I'm just saying. Don't be too dogmatic in what you think you know. Allow God to speak to you again and challenge you in these areas. And these actually can be times when we hinder hearing God's voice. Do you remember I spoke also about confirmation bias? Sometimes we only come to God to confirm what we already want and we're already thinking. We don't actually listen to what he might be saying extra because we're confirmed. Well, I don't know what God's saying. So you're not really listening. And that word to, to listen again, it's just to, it's part of hearing. It's the first part of hearing is to listen. And it also means, apparently, it can also mean spiritual hearing. Very closely related. Hearing what God is saying. Hearing him. And he said, whoever has will be given more. There's so much more. Don't limit God by what you think you know. And don't say, I know I don't need to listen. You can easily say I'm listening, but actually, it's not always the case. Hebrews 12, chapter 2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. And actually, there's quite a few words you could translate. It's the author, the originator the pioneer, the founder of our faith and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him for the joy that set before me endured the cross and he scorned its shame and a word I want to look at that has really challenged me in my understanding is the word for faith do you know you can believe and not have faith? Demons believe in God. Don't have faith in him. You can say you believe the Bible, but if you don't have faith in it, you won't live it out. And so often we get the words mixed up. And faith, apparently, means the root is be, be persuaded. And in a Christian sense, God's divine persuasion. Be persuaded. Faith. Faith. Something that never begins with us, always originates with God. <coughs> he is the divine persuader. Not me, it's not you. We've heard it quoted this morning about um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
don't begin with you it comes when you hear God's divine persuasion we need to hear God's divine persuasion because that always shows his preferred will always shows that and even that reading from Romans 12 you know be transformed by the renewing of your mind it's always to know God's will it's always to be able to discern what he's saying to us this word persuade it's actually used a few times in the Bible Romans 8 38 for I'm persuaded some say convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus and you know that word persuaded is the root of faith I'm persuaded something in me I'm being persuaded to believe and to trust to have confidence the Lord persuades the yielded believer to be confident in his preferred will, not mine. Faith is not saying, God, you said that, therefore I'm going to do this. That's different. God, what are you saying in this moment? What are you saying to me now? How do I respond? But actually, it doesn't just end with receiving God's divine persuasion. Because then we have to act on it good enough to say I, I've received it you then have to live it out there has to be an action to it you know I said in the in the Old Testament there's no word for obey it's to hear God and act appropriately and in the New Testament I think the, the, the mirror of that is Jesus said if you hear what I'm saying and put it into practice you're like a man who's building on rock and then you can stand the troubles and the things that come against us and I just wanted to look a bit about the actual working of this word faith. And I know I've said some of this before, I'm sure I have. But actually sometimes I'm seeing it in a different light. Just some examples of the Bible, how it can be lived out. In the Old Testament, Elisha met a Shunammite family. And they built a little house, on the, a, a room on the top of their house. So when he was out doing his pastoral things, or whatever he was doing, he could stay there. But the woman had no child and he wanted to bless her and, and he said to his son find out what she needs and he said she has no child which obviously in those days was uh, not a very nice thing if you couldn't have children it was a bit of a stigma so he prophesied over that she would have a child and she did and a few months later well, presumably nine or twelve months later she had a child and years go on and one day the child's out with his father in the field just cries my head my head father picks him up presumably it was a brain hemorrhage something like this and the child died so they sent for Elisha but he sends his servant off first of all and he said take my staff and lay it on the child but nothing happened so Elisha gets there and he, he goes up to the room and he lies on the on the cold body of the child to warm the child up thinking that's going to bring his life and it didn't and he said the Bible, and the Bible says Elisha got off and he walked up and down. And then he turned back to the child. And he commanded life and he came. What was he doing when he turned away? I believe he was seeking that divine persuasion that now's the moment. Because he didn't have it when he went in the room. What was the reason? Why? Well, that's also mirrored in Peter. Remember Peter and Dorcas goes into the room. What's Tabitha? I think it's Tabitha and Dorcas. One's Greek. I'm not sure which one. I'm sorry. Is it Dorcas who's Greek? Dorcas. And he says he goes in the room. He obviously sees the body. And then it goes on. He says, and time goes. And then he turned back to the body. What was Peter doing in those moments when he couldn't look at the body? And then he turns. And Dorcas is raised to life. But it's the same Peter who sometimes later went to the temple and saw a lame man. Never walked in his life. And all he, he doesn't say he turned away from him or anything. 
And maybe he'd seen that man many times before, because in those days, do you know, lame people did a service to the Jews. You might not think it, but it was a position, because Jews were told to give to the poor and the lame. So they served a function. And it was outside the temple. And he might have been there, that may be his regular spot. But on this occasion, Peter just said to him, I've got no money. But what I will give you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And he helped him up. And I believe that was divine persuasion at that moment. He'd heard God and he responded. Different ways raising different people. I heard a story, and I, I know I have told you this, but again, it just fits for me. A man called um, Harry Greenwood of the Chard Fellowship. Chard's not far away, up in Somerset. Early part of the renewal. And he was called one night to go to a man who was dying of cancer. His family called him. And Harry said when he walked into the room, he knew that that cancer was bigger than his God <coughs> at that moment. And so he turned away. And he walked up and down until he found the place where his God was bigger than the cancer. And it wasn't here he knew it. He knew it here. And he turned back to the body. And it was a battle, but the man was miraculously raised. Every bit of cancer gone. But it was divine persuasion that he then acted on. But he was honest, there was a point when actually it appeared as if that was too big. There were times, you know, when Jesus said, you might have to pray and fast about this one. But why do we pray and fast? What's it to do? So we can hear God, isn't it? Isn't that what we do it for? So there's times we might say, I can't pray for this at the moment. I'm going to wait, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to wait for when I know. Now this is the perfect thing, isn't it? I've got the divine persuasion that what we're going to pray for now is going to happen. Not could happen, but will happen. Faith, divine perspective, begins with listening. Listening what God is saying. A couple of examples. The woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. Ceremonially an outcast. Made everyone else unclean if she touched them. And yet you look at her testimony. All I have to do is touch the hem of his garment. She was divinely persuaded that all she had to do was get there, touch him, and she'd be well. That's exactly what happened. And then Jesus said, woman, your faith, what a compliment. I believe she'd been divinely persuaded. All she had to do, go and touch Jesus, push through the crowd, and she'd be healed, and she was. And what about the centurion? What about him, Jesus? All you have to do is say the word. You don't even have to come to the house. In those days, there was no New Testament. So had he read Isaiah 55? Had it? I don't know. Had he heard it read? When I speak, when I send forth my word, it never fails to accomplish the purpose for which I send it. Had he heard that? Was he actually saying, Jesus, I think you're God? Do you only have to say the word? I think he was divinely persuaded that all yeah. he needed to do was say, Jesus, you say the word. Yeah. And it happened. Acts 14, 9 to 11. You don't often hear this talked about. I've never talked about this bit before. Paul's preaching. God, wouldn't it be great to do this if I was the Paul? And I'm looking around now. Listen to this story. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth, never walked. And this man was listening to the words of Paul, who looked intently at him. So Paul was looking at the man now intently. And he saw, Paul saw, that the man had faith to believe. He had the faith to believe to be healed. And in a loud voice, Paul called out, stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped. 
he jumped up and began to walk. The man had been divinely, divinely persuaded. Paul could see it. But I think it was happening in Paul as well because he'd been divinely persuaded. All he has to do is say, stand up, and it was going to happen. Do you know what I had a picture the other day? Have you seen the jack-in-the-boxes? It was like, stand up, and it was like the button was pressed, a man whose <laughs> feet were lame, never walked, no muscles that are active, and he's jumping up and walking. Come on, that's a bit of something. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Breaks all logic. Divine persuasion when you act on it. But then I had a challenge. I can do some thinking, you can see. Because why does Jesus then say, oh, you of little faith? If it's all about God, why is he saying, oh, you of little faith? And apparently this phrase is mentioned about five times. Luke does one in Luke 12. You know, why are you worried about what you're going to wear? Why are you worried about what, you know, what food you're going to eat? Oh, you of little faith. Another time you use it is when the boat's about to sink. Disciples get up, quiet. I have little faith. And there's others. When they didn't have any bread. Oh, they worried because Jesus oh, didn't bring any bread. Oh, don't you remember the 5,000? Why have you a little faith? And I thought, is that what it means, little faith? And so I looked at it. And apparently it says this. Little faith actually means little in number or low in quantity. Properly, it means few occurrences of applications of faith. Few occurrences of applications of faith. Jesus is telling them off on these situations. Why didn't you apply faith? Why, why didn't you apply the faith you have? You're not listening to me. Don't you hear? Haven't you seen what I've been doing? Why don't you apply? So it's not actually, oh, you have little faith. It's just that you're not listening to apply the faith. It's few in number, few in quantity. Somebody described it like this. Little faith describes someone dull to hearing the Lord's voice or disinterested in walking to intimately with him. In contrast, the goal of life is to receive the Lord's gift of faith, to act accordingly in each scene of life, respond to the, this, this divine you know, persuasion, and then act it out. I was thinking this morning of a, the size of a mustard seed, faith as small, small as a mustard seed. I looked this up this morning. Do you know a mustard seed is about one millimetre? two millimetres across. Apparently it's the smallest seed that farmers in, in those days in Israel would have been using. It's a spice. You know, a mustard seed. But then Jesus compares it to a mulberry tree. A mulberry tree grows to about 20 feet in height. Which is tall. And they still grow then. But apparently with a mulberry tree you know, there's a lot of ground in Israel was barren and, and difficult and lots of rocks. And this mulberry tree actually often would wrap its roots around these rocks. And if you tried to transplant it from one place to another, you had a fight on your hands because it was anchored so deeply. I think there's a message even in that. Some things in your life might be so deep-rooted that actually even a mustard seed of the faith of God's divine persuasion can see it lifted up. And thrown into the sea. And I find that this is comparison. You know, the Jews have this, their sense of humor was comparison. You know, take the plank out of your own eye before you try and move the splinter. Or have you ever seen a camel go through the eye of a needle? It was this exaggeration. It's here again. A mustard seed can move a mulberry tree that's 20 feet high. The right kind of faith. Genuine faith. I'd like to close with a couple of things. I had read a book years ago by a man called Charles Price. 
He talked about the real faith. And I came across this statement again the other day, and I'd just like to read it to you. It says this. We have made faith a condition of mind when it is a divinely imparted grace of the heart. We can receive faith only as he gives it. You cannot manufacture faith. You cannot work it up. You can believe a promise and at the same time not in faith appropriate it. Genuine spiritual faith is not our ability to count it done. But it is the deep consciousness divinely imparted to the heart of man that it is, is done. I can say it's done in my mind as many times as you like, yeah. but when I get it's done here, yeah. I know it's done. Yeah. And that's exactly what he's saying. It is done. It is faith. It is the faith that only God can give. Do not struggle in the power of the will. What a mistake to take our belief in God and call it faith. Christ, the living word, is our sufficiency. He's the author. He's the perfecter of our faith. <clears throat> I'd like to finish with something that happened here about a month ago. And these things, I've been mulling these things over about what faith is. God's divine persuasion. I'm thinking, am I right? Is this what it's saying? Is there more to this? And then four weeks ago, David Barnett spoke in tongues. And Tony Higgins interpreted that word. And I'd like to read again. This was to us. We should remember what was said to us here. Good. We should. So I transcribed it down. This is it. Surely he is the God of the impossible. You look down upon your illness. You look down upon your sickness. You look at those diseases that have plagued you for many a year. But the Lord your God, he will greatly encourage you this morning to keep your eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus. And as you fix your eyes upon your Lord, there shall come into your very spirit a sense of real faith. You will be persuaded by the faith that the Lord your God gives you that nothing is impossible with God. For your God is the God of the impossible. And so look to the Lord and see him as your healer. See him as your rescuer. And remember, he is the God of the impossible. The divine persuader. The God of the impossible. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Pray, Father, you'll help us to listen. Help us to lay anything else that could be a hindrance to us hearing you afresh. Help us to lay it down. Your very words here were, Father, that you're the God of the impossible. That you would impart faith to our hearts to believe for more. We're not just head knowledge. You're going to release faith in us that counts it as done. God, we want to live in that reality. Yeah. We've read it, Father, how Peter lived in it, the woman lived in it, the centurion lived in it, the lame man who'd never walked believed that he could walk again. Although he had a faith to believe he could, and it worked. God, we want to see these things happen. Yeah. Father, we want to see that today, this day of all days, Jesus Christ risen conquered death curtain in the temple torn open new life new purpose for each one of us victory over every negative thing in our lives pray you'll move holy spirit come now and just touch us afresh open our ears and like that mulberry tree father those things that have rooted us to the past 
those things that we still struggle with and it's hard to get them out father release that faith into our hearts though where we know it is done but it comes from you help us to listen help us to trust help us to believe and move on and let us live in the joy that Jesus came to give us. He endured the cross. For him it was a joy because of what he was seeing in the future. Us. Me and you. Be grateful for today, Father. Thank you that Jesus was ascended into heaven. He's seated now at the right hand place. The right hand side of the Father. And we're seated with him. That's the promise. We want to give you thanks. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for dying for us when we didn't deserve it. And even today, we wouldn't deserve it still. Thank you, Father, for the new life you give us. In Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.